Hello and welcome to Camp Xbox. The original Xbox had plenty of exclusives that are well talked about today. Of course, you have Halo and Fable, or even hidden gems like Otogi or Phantom Dust that have gotten more attention with time. Today I'm interested in looking at Xbox exclusives that only some talk about. Of course, you may have played these obscure games, but I believe most people have not. I tried to base it on the user aggregate website Backlog and looked into what Xbox exclusives had under 10 plays. And I picked 5 obscure ones today. And I'm not saying that they're good, but I wanted to give them a look and let you know if they're worth a second take. Also, be sure to let me know what obscure Xbox exclusives you'd like me to look at next. As always, all footage was captured off original Xbox hardware, and I want to thank my YouTube channel members. But let's go ahead and dive right in. Let's start this list off with Iron Phoenix, an Xbox exclusive from Sega, which came out on March 26, 2005. This exclusive is extremely interesting because it's very forward-thinking, but not in the best way possible. This is a 3D brawler fighting game where huge groups fight against each other. When this game was released, one of its most prominent criticisms was its lack of a single player story mode, something that in 2024 is commonplace but it was a substantial negative back then. Nowadays, internet connections on a console are the standard. Many people in the 6th generation still did not have their console connected to the internet. So the prospect of a multiplayer only game was not the best one. It makes this one have a weird limbo because it was destroyed back then for being half a game, and now the online is only playable through XKai Link, seeing how this doesn't have Insignia support yet, giving reason as to why this game has fallen into obscurity. With Backlogged only having 7 people claiming it has played, and it has one 5 star review. The game here is rather interesting though, and I had some fun playing it. There is a single player training mode to get you settled in, and a lot of thought is put into this game. Movement is smooth with double jumps, wall runs, and a sense of speed that makes control a blast. With a significant number of characters to choose from, each character has stats that make them stand out from each other. There were also various weapons to pick from, and what I thought would just be damage differences ended up being things that considerably changed the gameplay. You can have long range weapons that hit far but are slow. My favorite weapons though were gauntlets that let you hit fast and rack up some insane damage. You can experience all of this in the bots mode, which is just a practice mode for online gameplay. Each of these modes has 16 players all fighting against each other in various deathmatch modes. The idea is excellent and when you get consecutive combos with its smooth combo system, it's a blast but some issues stop it from being great. The one-on-one -on -one fights work really well, but once you get into the giant group fights, the camera does not know what to do, and it puts itself at horrible angles. This makes fighting and keeping track of yourself torturous. One of the most significant offenses a game can have is not being able to look at the game properly. The game also has a noticeable lag, making it a continued mess. The fighting remains entertaining though, and I would have loved to have seen a single player mode of some type, even if it was a simple arcade mode. There is a lot to like here, and I enjoyed my time, but alone it was about an hour's worth of fun. I had a blast with the beast mode where you are a colossal monster fighting everyone else, but after you play it once, you really just want to play it with others or in some type of linear fashion in a story. I really enjoyed the characters. All the stages look excellent, and the added bonus of custom soundtracks is fun, but it's not something worth picking up because the playtime is limited. I think that is why only a few bring this one up. It's neat, but the longevity to return to it just isn't there. It would have done much better if it came out 10 years later or released with a single player mode. Only pick this one up if you're really curious. Next up is Knight's Apprentice Memorix Adventures. This game was published and developed by Microids and released on June 15th, 2004. This is a budget title action platformer with a King Arthur feel. 
With characters like Merlin, there's magic all around as well as sword combat. If you've played a platformer of this era, you will get the same experience here. Looking at Backlog, this game only has two people saying they've played it, and one of those is a 0.5 star review. This is a budget release, so there are some obvious limitations here. Not much will stand out graphically, but it's not a botch job. It looks solid for what it is, and I always prefer something brighter and colorful over dark and grim, which was starting to become the norm as we rolled on into the next generation. There are many bright greens and colorful characters, and it's a solid effort. That being said though, the game is very familiar. You explore levels similar to those of other platformers, such as grasslands and lava areas. You are dodging obstacles and hopping around. It's the normal hit with your sword and hop around gameplay with nothing fresh or really great behind it. That doesn't make it a bad game, but understandably it was forgotten when compared to the amazing platformers of the generation or even just on the Xbox. It's a lot of fetch quests and running back and forth, hopping on moving platforms or sliding down tunnels. It controls decently, and nothing glitchy ever happened to me, jumping is just a bit stiff, but you get used to it. It's the same idea when it comes to combat. The enemy variety just isn't really there. It grows a little boring over time. The game has a bunch of enemies at once, and you can take them all on easily. The biggest fault of this game is that a basic game with nothing new can be fun, but the stiffness and lack of variety keep it at a mundane experience level. The story is interesting though, and if you like King Arthur or Medieval Tales, you can have fun with this one. You don't play King Arthur, instead you are an apprentice to Merlin, you must go against a great evil, it's all simple stuff. No character is memorable, but it's fine enough to keep the game's pacing up. It's a cheaper feeling experience with royalty free sounding music and sound effects pulled out of a sound library. Yet there are games like Blinks and Voodoo Vince, or if you want to go for a budget game, Torque is a far more interesting one. This game plays it too safe and falls into a sea of mundaneness. It's not bad at all, it's just forgettable. If you played it, you might have fun with it, but you'll think the whole time that you could be playing something far better. Definitely an obscure release because it doesn't do anything remotely new, and generally I like to see at least some uniqueness, and I know most people do, and that's why an incredible game like Voodoo Vince far outshines this as a well-remembered Xbox exclusive nowadays. Uniqueness is what's most memorable about a game, and you don't get that here, making this a game that hardly gets brought up anymore. Seablade is the next game on the list, and this one was published by Simon & Schuster and developed by Visionscape Interactive. This shooter game has you commanding an aircraft in a post-apocalyptic future. The Earth has been flooded in this timeline, and you must defend the South from warlords in the North. This Xbox exclusive has been forgotten, with only 7 players saying they've played it on Backlogged, with 2 awful reviews, and a 0.8 average on the website. It's a rough score for this game, but this is a mess of a game, and understandably, no one wants to talk about this one. The plot of this game is set up mission by mission. Generally, you're either collecting tokens in the sky and water, or saving stranded people and bringing them back to their base. It's mediocre in design, but it would be fine if the gameplay was fun, which unfortunately Seablade isn't entertaining. It's actually quite a challenging game to get into. Controlling the ship is fine at first. You move with the left stick and throttle with the right. You zoom around some nice looking levels. It at least has a fun future world, something akin to Waterworld where places are built around oceans, but navigation is rough. Many of the rescue levels have you precisely navigating tight areas, and with the looseness of the controls, you will be flying everywhere except where you need to go. On top of that, enemies swarm against you, and somehow the combat is even worse than the controls. 
With the loose control, it's hard to keep a lock on an enemy, and they can move all around you with pinpoint shooting accuracy. So once you're getting shot, it's hard to get rid of them. Managing all of this, even with the easiest difficulty, is rough, and you will die constantly. Making some of the rescuing missions an absolute chore to run through. It's frustrating and not fascinating enough to be rewarding when you finally beat these levels. You unlock more ships to make it more customizable, but the gameplay's roughness does not get fixed when moving to better ships. However, I love the concept of moving from air to underwater combat, but the underwater sections are half-baked. It's slow and barely anything happens underwater. There is no real point to going underwater. This game needed to lean more heavily towards navigating both terrains, but instead it opted into being a boring flight shooter that's frustrating. This game screams awful to me, and it's no wonder it never left the Xbox. I hate to be so negative, but I would have loved to have a shooter with this concept work well. I do like the look of the levels, but the mission design is bland, the controls are awful, and it never does anything special. I understand why it's been buried for a long time, it's just a frustrating mess. I always hope to find some hidden gem or something to enjoy out of an Xbox exclusive, but this one can stay buried until I have to do a full review one day. <laughs> So after such a disappointing game, it's best to talk about something much better with Furious Karting, an Xbox exclusive that was released on March 18th, 2003. It was developed by Babylon Software and published by Atari. This is a kart racing game that has arcade party fun and really tight controls. Furious Karting takes an interesting stab at the kart racing genre, and I wouldn't say it's one of the best, but it's still a blast when playing. This one only had three people playing it on Backlogged, and no one has written a review for it, and this one doesn't even have a Wikipedia article. This one has been mostly forgotten. But let me tell you, it has some fun things to offer. What's nice about this kart racer is that it does have a single player story mode with full cutscenes. I won't say the story is riveting, but I enjoyed the silly sitcom feel. It's bright and colorful and has that edginess of the early 2000s that I really love. It's an excellent way to break up everything between each race. The actual races are controlled well, and the maps are exciting. I like the mechanic where you can turn tight corners and turn up your cart to the side for stunt points and a harder turn. You can also do flips and other tricks while in the air. The points you get funnel into the stats of the character you are playing. What's cool though is that there are other things you can do to make your driver better, such as a dedicated bat button to slap other drivers as they drive by like in Road Rash. It plays very well and controlling the low to the ground carts feels right. It helps that the racetracks are far from bland and have a fun energy. They are real world areas like parking lots and shopping malls, but the detail thrown in is excellent. And I like the lighting on the nighttime levels. The ability to add custom soundtracks is a nice touch as well. The only issue I had coming out of this one was the power-ups. When I think of kart racing power-ups and weapons, there are some great ones out there, but these are lackluster. Of course, you have the usual boost and such, but otherwise it's throwing chickens or doing a flip while driving. It's nothing special, and the added chaos of some good weapons could have improved this experience. I do wish more people talked about this one, because it's a lot of fun. The story is not something you're going to write home about, and there are far tighter controlling racers on the Xbox, but this one excels at just being a good time. It's fun to race around on your little vehicle, dodging and hitting enemies. The obscurity of this game stems from the Xbox having better racers on the console, and maybe Nintendo having the insanely hyped Double Dash releasing later that year, which is the much better game of these two. It's just a case of overshadowing and mixed reviews, but I say this one is worth trying.
we are ending today's list with Toxic Grind, developed by Exile Entertainment and published by THQ. This game was released on October 27, 2002. This Xbox exclusive extreme sports title is all about BMX but with a dystopian flair. Think about Tony Hawk if it was set in the Running Man universe. This is one I was excited to check out as I enjoy extreme sports games, but unfortunately I quickly learned after starting this one why it is so obscure. On Backlogged, it only has four people saying that they played this one with no reviews, and this game was released to detrimental scores by critics, and it makes sense. Toxic Grind takes the Tony Hawk formula and makes it all about stunt bikes. From the start, I was deceived a little by this game. The first level, you're given a reasonably tame level and goal setup, as you would expect from a game of this type. The story is set in this dark dystopian world, and as a biker, you are drawn into a live or die BMX show, and you must survive to win. It has this silly but fun style, and the bike controls seem simple at first, but the fundamental build never works together. You can do what's typically expected from a game like this, bunny hop, grind, and manual. They all work fine on their own, but combining it together in combos is a mess. The double up press for manuals doesn't feel great and often messes up, making your combos fail. Combos are needed to keep your point totals up, but grinding is so glitchy and you will usually fall out of rails and bail. It's hard to explain just how bad these controls feel because on paper they seem sound. It's just an execution, nothing feels right when doing it. On the more open-ended levels, like the intro, it feels okay, and I wish they had done something more like the Matt Hoffman BMX series, but instead it became a close quarters gauntlet. The third mission of this game has to be one of the worst missions I've ever played. You're in a tiny cramped area with fast moving death traps. You have to get a higher score than the CPU, and what's funny is the CPU will constantly fail too. So it's a tug of war that never ends. The shallow controls are evident here, which lasts for the rest of the gaming experience. Toxic Grind is not an entertaining game, and it's understandable why this one never made a lasting impact. If you need your extreme sports fix, go to Tony Hawk. This is just a messy game, and the dystopian reality show angle could be so much fun, but the actual gameplay squanders any longevity that this one has. That wraps it up for today though, surprisingly I picked all of these games because they were obscure Xbox exclusives and almost all were understandable. Seablade and Toxic Grind are poorly made games that lacked any longevity due to their lack of entertainment factor. Knight's Apprentice is a fun platformer but falls below many other great platformers. Iron Phoenix is an ambitious and exciting title, but it was released when most games needed a single player mode. Furious Karting was caught in a sea of more extraordinary racers on the console, even though this one was a great time. It's always fun to look at these titles that have fallen to the wayside because they give better context for gaming history. Even if I didn't like some of these games, they deserve some limelight. If you enjoyed or have never heard of any of these games, let me know in the comments below. Your opinion is important, and I'd love to hear from you. Also leave a like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel to keep up with the retro Xbox content, and I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube channel members, camp counselors, and campers. Thank you so much for your support, you really help out the channel. But I'll see you here next time, at Camp Xbox.